Okay, so here we have an example here of, again, we've got a church and um, they're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I think there might be some differences. Like the way Peter is, the way Paul is, like all these different personalities, all these different styles. So personally, I feel like, you know, Paul planted us, so he's the boss. Yeah, well, I think Apollos came after Paul and he was actually better, let's be honest. He was more of a chill dude or he was better at this and that. And, well, you know what, I'm going with Peter because he was the one who was he's right with Jesus. Original. So, you know, yeah, he's yeah. really like, you know, Church of Jerusalem. He's like, well, dudes, you guys are all off your heads. Who would follow anyone other than Christ? You know, and they're starting to have these debates amongst themselves. And Paul's like, oh my Lord, what is going on, you guys? What is he wanting? He's just wanting unity. And at the end of the day, guys, we're after unity. Now, we're not talking about false worldly unity where we just, hey, tolerance, tolerance. You know, you do you, I'll do me, I'll just believe what we want. No, we're talking yeah. about unity in the yeah. word. We're talking about unity of the faith. But yeah. at the end of the day, we, God is wanting us to be one yeah. of one mind. So we've got an issue going on in the church at Corinth. Now turn over to chapter 3. And Edie, I'm going to get you to do verse 1 and 2. And then, Dad, I'll get you to do 3, 4 and 5. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear, neither yet now are you able. For you are yet carnal, for as there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? For while one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? Okay, so if there's any one of you, darling, sitting here listening, and you've been thinking, you know what, I think we should follow so-and-so, and I think so-and-so is right, and I think, you've actually just shown yourself to be carnal, to be a babe in Christ. Because that, I was like, oh no. <laughs> because that is what babes do. Where, and I don't mean babes in the good sense, by the way. I mean in the bad sense. You're immature, okay? When you are choosing personalities and you're thinking, you know, I follow so and so, and you're just getting silly about it and you're thinking, oh, oh, the dramas that are going on at the moment. I follow so and so and I follow so and so. If you're doing that, you're being immature. Paul's saying, you know what? We're both just ministers by whom you believed. We just brought you the word. Whoever it was, we just brought you the word. Um, Eden, can you read six and seven? Ali, eight and nine, please. I have planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers not, oh, together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. You are God's building. Okay, so what Paul's saying here is, I actually planted you guys. I planted this church, um, and Paul was the first one through. But you know that Priscilla and Aquila, they then sent Apollos through to that church, um, it was a fantastic church that Paul had planted. And so Paul came second. So it says, you know, he, Paul planted, but Apollos came through and watered. But at the end of the day, who's the boss, guys? God. God is the ultimate boss because he's the one who gives the increase. But there is an interesting situation that goes on here. So they're not talking about Paul preaches this way and Apollos preaches this way. They're not necessarily talking about different doctrine here. They're just talking about their personal preferences. You know, I like so-and-so and I like so-and-so. I reckon this preacher is really aggressive. Oh, this one's a bit soft. That one's more loving, yeah, or whatever the case may be. Uh, so now we're at verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. Who's speaking here? Paul. Okay. And who is he saying gave him the grace to be able to be the founding father there? God. Okay. So here we see Paul saying... Um, God gave me grace to be able to lay foundations for you. I laid the foundation. Who planted the church? Paul. 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 But then he goes on and he says, another is building upon the foundation I've laid. So I planted the church. I laid a foundation. Somebody else has come through after me and they have built upon the foundation that I laid. So it would be as if Ryan and I planted the church in Tukoroa 
And then we went on and traveled around and planted other churches and other people, the ministers that are there, they began to build up the church upon what we had laid. And what we laid was the basics of the faith, the fundamentals of the faith. He then says, let every man take heed how he builds upon. So now he's talking about the ministers. Whoever comes in and builds upon my foundation, watch it. Watch it. You do need to make sure you're biblical. And we've said that before. The first thing is we just need to make sure what they're doing is biblical. You stay there, but I'm just going to read you one verse out of Romans 15. You can write it down if you want to jot it down. But Romans 15, 20 says, I have strived, this is Paul preaching, I've strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Paul actually didn't really like doing that. There was something interesting about him. He was a way making dude. He liked to go to new turf and he liked to lay foundations. He was an evangelist through and through. He liked to hit a new area and lay the foundation where Christ had not been preached before. He actually said that, I like to go where Christ has not been named. And I like to lay the foundation of Christ and him crucified. He would be what we would often call, because he said, I lay the foundation. That's where we might get the name founding father. He was a founding father of many churches. The seven churches I believe that he wrote to, um, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, Thessalonians, Romans, whatever, all the rest of them. Um, He was a founding father. He would lay them. But then others would come through and build upon what he had laid. So you're up to verse 11, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, 80, 11, and 12, please. For other foundation foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Ali 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Okay, now remember what we're talking about here is the work of these people who come in after the foundation. So we're talking about ministers. Mm -hmm. Ministers who come in, I know we always read that, and people always read that about how they build their own lives which is fine, you can judge yourself how you are building your own life. But in context, Paul's actually talking about, he's a master builder, he's laid a foundation. It'd be like we put the concrete slab out, but then the next crew who come in and start putting stuff on top of it, you gotta test that too, you hope it's good quality. Just because the person who laid the the slab is really reliable, you have still gotta test the spirits of those who are coming in and now building the actual structure of the house because they might not be so reliable. So he's actually saying those guys, they might be building with gold, silver, precious stone. And you know what? The fire, the word of God, Jesus Christ, the eyes of Christ, the eyes of fire are going to test the work of every man. Verse 14 and 15, right? If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If, a, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Verse 16 and 17, Tariha, 1 Corinthians 3. Oh, sorry, Jay, can you read it? Verse 16 and 17. Yep. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Now, again, let's remember in context, who are we speaking about here? The church in Corinth. Yeah. And what is the, what is the flow of thinking that we've just had? He's speaking about, I led the foundation, you're being built. I, this church is being built. I've laid the foundation, others, ministers are coming through and they are building. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hail, stubble, I'm not too sure. We need to test that. But at the end of the day, um, he just says, their work, those ministers who come through, their work is going to be tested. Verse 16, he's saying to that church, you guys are the temple. The Holy Ghost is living in that church. If any man defiles that temple, God will destroy him. So if a man comes through and is bringing false doctrines, is building wood, hay and stubble, God, the fire, God is a consuming fire, will destroy him. Again, people use that scripture to say you're defiling the temple about what you're eating or what you're drinking. But in context, that scripture is talking about false doctrine coming in. It's talking about ministers coming in and building on that church and defiling God's temple with false doctrine, lies, things that don't line up with the truth of the gospel. They are the ones that the fire of God is going to destroy them. Wow. Okay, so let's turn to chapter four. 
We'll just follow on this flow of thinking. Verse 1, Tariha. Let a man so account of us as of, as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Who is Christ? Christ Where? is the Word. Okay. So let a man so account of ministers. Now, it's anybody. Paul, Apollos, all these people who are coming in and building, what are they? They're supposedly ministers of the Word. That's what um, Luke 1, 2 tells us. So he says ministers of Christ, ministers of the Word. They are just stewards of the mysteries of God. They're here to bring the Word not here to bring personal opinion, prejudices, like if you don't eat this and do that and this yeah. and that and this and that. That is not what they're there to do. Do you know, one of the commentaries said a very interesting thing. He said, if a minister of God is not fed daily on God's word or God's bread, his teaching will soon begin to deteriorate in direct correlation to his diet. So if he's not eating the word all the time, a minister of the word, how can he be offering up the word anymore? Yeah, Whatever he's eating, that's what he will begin to offer up. So the question is, biblical ministers are those who serve up. Ministers just mean servants. Yeah. They're those who serve up. Biblical ministers serve up the not word, the not the world. That's how you know if they're biblical ministers. Mm. They serve up the word, not the world. If they are constantly eating of the world, their doctrine is going to begin to deteriorate because they're not feasting on the bread of, of life. They're not feasting on the word. So what are they going to start offering up? World, world, world. Verse 4, right. For I know nothing by myself. Sorry, chapter 1, uh, chapter 4, verse 4. Yep. 4, verse 4, yep. Moreover, it is required of stewards that a man be found faithful. That's verse 2. Moreover, oh, what did I say? Did I say, oh, I'm sorry, chapter okay. 4, verse 2. Sorry. Moreover, it is required of stewards that a man be found faithful. Gracious. So guys, those he's judging these ministers because he goes on and says, I've applied these things to Apollos and I. I'm, he's saying... We ministers who come in and build, we better be bringing the word. Come on. We better be bringing the word. We yeah. better be found faithful. Okay? Let's just jump down to 14. We're running out of time here. Verse 14 says, um, 14 and 15, Ali. I, I, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Oh, stop. Because this is getting good. Because what we're actually discussing here is what do we do now? We've got Paul, Apollos, Cephas, Christ. We've got all these names being mentioned. At the church of Corinth. Mm -hmm. Paul's trying to sort out the issue. He's been building up some things about make sure they're saved. Make yeah. sure what they're bringing in is in line with the scriptures and so forth. Now he's getting to a point. He's going, listen to me, guys. I'm just going to wind up this issue right here. Yeah. I follow Paul. I follow Paul. And some people in our ministry are doing that right now. Mm, I'm thinking about jumping ship. I'm thinking about following so-and-so and following so-and-so. Yeah. Right? It's to you I'm talking about right now. It's to you, Apostle Paul, the Spirit of Christ who's speaking. He goes, listen. I'm not trying to shame you because you've been naughty. I follow so and so. I think they're doing right and they're doing wrong. I'm not trying to shame you, but you are my sons. You are my beloved sons, and I want to warn you. Verse 15. For though you have 10,000 instructors, instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Okay. Now we're getting to a point where Paul is beginning to go, let's just remember you got a lot of people coming through and building. Yeah. But you've only got... One <laughs> there was only one person who came through and laid that foundation. Yeah. Okay, you got a lot of instructions. You don't have a lot of fathers. And then he says, I have begotten you in the gospel. Okay, he's beginning to pull out his authority now. So he's moved from, yeah, you know, whatever. Just test them, see what people are saying. You know, yeah. people are going to be judged by God. And yeah, all right, guys. It's getting yeah. to the point I'm like, okay. I just got to tell you, I just need to warn you, you're my sons. Let's stop it. I beget you in the gospel. Yeah. Okay? I'm not saying I'm a big shot, but I'm saying I've got authority. Yeah. I beget you in the gospel. Verse 16, our pippy. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Okay. So listen to me. I beget you in the gospel. I've got authority to say this. Copy me. Okay. What should I do? Should I do what Peter's yeah, doing? Too. Shall I do what Apollos is doing? Do what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay? Why? Because I beget you in the gospel. At the end of the day, if it's not a clear biblical matter, what do you do? You go with the order of the authority. Yeah. What's dad doing? Yeah. Okay? If that's what dad's doing, that's what I'm going to do. If it's not clearly unscriptural or anything like that, I am going to be an imitator. Verse 17, Reza. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful Whose son? Lord. My beloved okay, son. another one of Paul's sons. 
Yes. Paul Sons. Paul's. Who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways. Whose ways? Paul's. My Paul's. Paul's. <laughs> Paul's. <laughs> Which being Christ, as I yes. teach everywhere in every church. Okay, so he's really pulling out his credentials now, isn't he? Yeah. He's like, it's beyond that, oh, whatever, whatever. Now he's like going, okay, I founded you. Yeah. I'm your father. I'm the one who planted this church. I'm the one who helped introduce you to the Lord and, and biblical discipleship and all these things. You copy me. Shut your face. Stop being silly. We've got a job to do. Come, on in. Come and imitate me. So you know what I'm going to have to do? I'm going to have to send you one of my faithful disciples who I know walks in the same steps as me so you can even remember what I do in all these different areas. You need someone to remind you of my ways. You can't remember, I know, I, I'm far away traveling in another church now and somewhere along the line you've forgotten my ways. Timothy's going to come and he's going to remind you of what I do in all these different situations that may not be a clear line in the sand, but you need to remember them. And in fact, all the churches that I've planted, this is how I teach them all. You will do things this way. Now, if you're called out from that church, you go on to the apostolic, you can go with another house and the leading of the authority of that house. But while you're in one of my churches, you're going to do what I tell you to do, unless you can show me from the scriptures otherwise. Got it? End of the matter. Fantastic. So there we have an issue where at the end of the day, if it comes down to authority, um, if it's not a clear scriptural matter, you do what the boss is doing. All right. And let's conclude that one in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Corinthians chapter 10. Who would like to read a few verses for us? Tati Hart, you do 13 and 14. Mm -hmm. But we will not boast of things without our measure. However, I'm going to pause at a few things because I just need to, you know, as I do. Yeah, um, so, you know what? I should probably just read it. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be really idea. annoying. Okay, <laughs> but I want you to read it in your Bible. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 13. Very important. We will not boast of things without our measure. But according to the measure of the rule which God has distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. And you're like, what the heck is he talking about? Yeah. Look in the commentaries. Have a study. What it is, is it the measure of the rule which God has distributed to you is your area of authority. It's the place that God has given you. For instance, if you're a father, it's your family. If you're a boss in a workplace, it's your workplace. So you don't have grace for somebody else's workplace. Mm. You know, you don't have grace over somebody else's family. You have grace, the measure of the rule which God has distributed to you. So Paul says, I don't boast about things outside of my measure. Okay, so churches I didn't plant. I don't talk about them. I don't get into all their nitty gritties. I, but according to the measure of the rule that God has distributed to us, a measure that reaches to you. So he's saying you are actually a part of under my influence, of under my rule. God has actually distributed rule. Say rule. Rule. So God has given the rulership of the church of Corinth to who? Paul. Paul. Right. Verse 14. We stretch not ourselves beyond our measure. So in other words, we don't go beyond the rule which God has given to us. And stretching beyond, by the way, Thayer says it means to extend beyond your prescribed bounds, to stretch out beyond measure, to stretch out over much. For instance, if one father starts rebuking the children of another father who is present, that could be seen as stretching beyond your measure. Okay. This is very important to note in this point, guys, when it comes to authority, because there are occasions where a father from one family starts telling the kids from another family what to do. While the parents are still there. While the parents are still present. And the parents are not missing their, they might just not want to deal with it right then and there, but it's their prerogative to deal with it. There are sometimes apostles and ministers who will actually be telling other people men's sphere of influence what they should or shouldn't be doing there could be a husband telling another man's wife what she should and shouldn't be doing with her cooking or her washing i mean this is not his sphere of influence correct correct this is what paul's dealing with here he's going listen another man's church his sphere of influence i don't tell them what to do i don't get into their nitty-gritty that's none of my business but when it comes to you, you are my business. I have authority over you. Anyway, he goes on and he says, um, we have stretched ourselves, uh, we have stretched not ourselves beyond our measure, 
as though we reached not unto you, for we are come as far as to you in our in preaching the gospel of Christ. Not boasting of things without our measure, which is another man's God ordained sphere of influence and authority. He actually goes on, he says it, that is, of another man's labor. But having hope when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. To preach the gospels in, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's line of things. Say another man's. Another man's line of things. Paul was very careful to not be talking about another man's sphere of influence. I want to say this right now because God wants me to address an issue. Some of you are listening more to people who don't have authority over you than to those who do. This could be wives to another another uh, woman's husband, another man. This could be children to another person. You know, if any of you like those parents. This can be disciples to another disciple. This can be disciples and a church to another apostles. I had a situation very early in my discipleship where, who's heard of Jackie Pullinger? Yeah. Phenomenal. Incredible, incredible minister. Amazing. Still witnessing over... She's just an incredible ministry, amazing woman of God. So when I got the chance to go and listen to her, I was like, yeah. I happened to get front row seats at her. There was like a thousand people there or whatever. I got front row seats. Um, I was actually very sick um, that weekend, very sick. And I was like, you know, kind of snuggled up sitting there. <laughs> Thank God it wasn't in the days of COVID. I was there by myself. My husband had given me the green light to go because I read her book when I first got saved. I was like right into her. And so anyway, I got the green light. Guess what happened? She called you up and prophesied. I kid you not. I kid you not. Of all the thousand people there, guess who she pointed out? Yep, yours truly. <laughs> she pointed to this little one right here and she said, Yeah, stand up. God wants to say to you, you have been called for such a time as this launched into this epic, phenomenal, wonderful prophecy. Part of it was... There are witches in this area who are aware of the work of the gospel that they, uh, you are doing and they are directly opposing you. The sickness that you have right now, the things that are going on in your family. But anyway, she went and gave me this epic prophecy and I literally felt like I was the most important person on the face of the earth. I felt like God was just separating me from everybody because clearly I am his special and favourite. For Jackie Pullinger to stop mid-meeting and prophesy and all these witches... To be focused on me. Oh. <laughs> Woo, the head was very yeah. difficult to make it out the doors on the way out. Yeah. <laughs> Sick and all. I was I mean everyone wanted to come and talk to me after that oh, prophecy. Yeah. You know, the thousand people, they weren't going to Jackie after the meeting, they all wanted to come and talk okay. to me. It was a good thing I was sick. Because yeah. <laughs> I probably would have <laughs> Anyways. I, I came back to my minister, right? <laughs> yeah. And I said, You will not believe what happened. Oh yeah. Oh, no. Jackie Fullinger pulled me out. Me. Me. <laughs> And I proceeded to tell him the prophecy. He did not look impressed at all. In fact, he was totally distracted while I was talking. Look at this. I mean, I was like trying to like, can you see how important I am? Yeah. I am important. Witches aren't after you. <laughs> oh, no. oh, yeah. That's what I was thinking. Oh, I wasn't saying terrible. it, but I was thinking it. Oh, yeah. They're after me. I am the big shot in your oh, church. No. Do you know what he said at the end of my big shot? He said, yeah, mate, go do that. Sorry, what was that, Jack? Oh, yeah. No, yeah. Da, 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 da. Sorry, what were you saying? Then I finish up and I'm like, amazing, right? A point and now. this, I kid you not, these are the four, four words he said. She's not your pastor. <laughs> That's what he said. She's not your pastor. And I was like, and? <laughs> what? She's Jackie Pullinger. <laughs> Way better than your pastor. Oh Who needs your pastor when you've got Jackie Pullinger? Oh, no. See how immature I was. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Had God given me Jackie Pullinger to raise me up in the gospel? Was Jackie Pullinger the one entrusted with discipling me through all of my multitudes of issues? Was Jackie Pullinger the one who lived with me on a day-to-day -day basis and had to deal with all my nonsense and emotions? No. God gave me a husband. God gave me a local pastor. And who do you think God was going to speak to about my spiritual growth first and foremost? My husband and my pastor. Okay. Not some traveling minister, bless her heart. She 
if she genuinely feels led to say things, look, to be honest, I have question marks about those things these days because I believe in order. Yeah. I believe it should have been, is your pastor here, mate? Is your authority here? Things should be done in right order. Yeah. So if it's another person's child, I wouldn't necessarily go to them. I'd say, where's your father? Where's your mother? I got something to share with them. So I feel like God is saying to some people today, hey, that guy's not your husband, ladies. Why are you listening to him more than your own husband? Hey, they're not your parents, kids. Why are you listening? Oh, they do that. They do. They're not your parents. Grace has been given by God to your pastor to pastor you, to your disciple to disciple you, to your parent to parent you, to your husband to husband you, and to your apostle to lead and guide you. Yeah. God, we just read, Paul said, God has distributed to them the measure of rule over you. So you watch in your pride. You don't go off after itching ears, going and finding somebody who's going to give you what your flesh wants. Some far more exciting adventure, like witches are after you. Well, that's way more exciting than hearing that I've just got to sit down and, you know, do my washing today and have a good attitude towards my husband today, right? I'd rather hear about witches chasing me down and I'm the most important person in the church. Turn to Hebrews 13, 7. You already know this one. God is a God of order. There are exceptional circumstances where he will go outside of this order, but otherwise God is going to lead you through biblical order. Hebrews 13, 7. Remember them that have the rule over you. Say, God gives people rule over me. God gives people rule over me. And who are these people? They're those who've spoken unto you the word. That's what it says there. Those who've spoken unto you the word of God. And it's their faith you are to follow, imitate. Considering the end of their conversation, their life, verse 17, you are to obey them. Who have what? The rule. And you are to submit yourself. They have been given a trust, guys, to watch for your souls. And they're the ones who've got to give an account. Jackie Pullinger didn't need to give an account for my discipleship. Bless her heart, my pastor had to give an account. So he's like, she's not your pastor. Sit down and shut up. This is what I'm telling you to do. Dude, it was so humbling. So humbling. And my flesh was like... Oh. It took a little bit for me to be able to give up that prophecy, mate. I held on to that thing for a little bit there. And uh, God had to rip the thing out of me. Okay, right now, listen to me. If you are seeking counsel from another husband, another parent, another disciple, another minister, another apostle, some of you are contacting other ministries for counsel, for prophecy, for direction, for confirmation. Dear God, lo and behold, I believe someone might have even contacted them to dob in your own authority. You believe your husband, your senior ministers might be wrong. And so I'll just take it upon myself to let another ministry know or another husband know or another disciple know. I think my minister's actually in the wrong. That is so incredibly immature, so incredibly proud, so dishonorable and ultimately Utterly unscriptural. Showing no honour to go to your oversights. See, and this is the thing. If you are being given right now, those of you who are listening, and you know you've received a prophecy from somebody who has no authority over you. You've been given a word of counsel. Somebody in your family may have. You've been given some direction. Hey, I don't know what your husband's saying, but you really should be. You know, I don't know if your disciple is really onto it. I think they're a little distracted with this. Your apostles, I think they're a little bit, you know, just letting you know you probably should be doing this. And you're loving that and you're listening to that and you're taking that unto yourself. Beware. Mm. Beware. This is what the scriptures are talking about right here. Do you know what you should, what should you say? If someone comes to you and goes, I'm just letting you know. Uh, they're not I've got authority over you, Reza, but they say I've got a prophecy for you. What should you say, Reza? You should go, uh, my disciples just over there. Go let them know. Thank you. Bam. Everybody say bam. 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 